Blog Talk Radio. Up, Mr. Brown. Yes, I was a member. But I was forced into this way of life. Hey, look, I've been dealing drugs ever since I was 12 years old. See, I didn't have the chances that you have, Miss Hawkins. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, Miss Hawkins. I mean, I wanted to get out, but they threatened to kill my mother. Who are you talking about, Mr. Brown? What they? They. Look at it. Kareem Akbar. That's right, the educated brother from the bank. He's the real head of the CMB. The brain's behind the whole thing. I told you, this thing is bigger than Nino Brown, and I got a list of food. Order. If I'm going Order down, I'll take a whole lot of people with me. Order in the court. Order in the court. Man, you hear this bullshit they be talking? Every day, man, it's like these motherfuckers is just like professional liars, you know what I'm saying? It's <laughs> wow. Listen. Bin Laden didn't blow up the projects. It was your nigga. Tell the truth, nigga. Push knock down the tower. Tell the truth, nigga. Push knock down the tower. Tell the truth, nigga. Bin Laden didn't blow up the projects. It was your nigga. Tell the truth, nigga. Push knock down the tower. Tell the truth, nigga. Push knock down the tower. I'm pledged no allegiance, nigga. Fuck the president's speeches. I'm baptized by America and covered in leeches. The dirty water that bleaches your soul and your facial features. Drowning you in propaganda that they spit through the speakers And if you speak about the evil that the government does The Patriot Act to track you to the type of your blood They try to frame you and say you was trying to sell drugs And throw a federal indictment on niggas to show you love This shit is run by fake Christians, fake politicians Look at their mansions and look at the conditions you live in All they talk about is terrorism on television They tell you to listen, but they don't really tell you their mission They funded Al-Qaeda and now they blame the Muslim religion Even though Bin Laden was a CIA Tactician, they gave him billions of dollars and they funded his purpose. Fahrenheit 9 11, that's just scratching the surface. Bin Laden didn't blow up the projects. It was your nigga. Tell the truth, nigga. Push knock down the tower. Tell the truth, nigga. Push knock down the tower. Tell the truth, nigga. Bin Laden didn't okay. blow up the projects. It was your nigga. Tell the truth, nigga. Push knock down the tower. Oh, Tell the truth, nigga. Push knock down the tower. They say the okay. rebels in Iraq still fight for the dog. That's bullshit, i show you why it's totally wrong Cause if another country invaded the hood tonight It'd be warfare through Harlem and Washington Heights I wouldn't be fighting for Bush or white America's dream I'd be fighting for my people's survival and self-esteem I wouldn't fight for racist churches from the south, my nigga I'd be fighting to keep the occupation out, my nigga You ever clock someone who talks shit or look at you wrong? Imagine if they shot at you and was raping your mom And of course Saddam Hussein had chemical weapons We sold them that shit after Ronald Reagan Election. Mercenary contractors fighting a new era Corporate military banking off the war on terror They controlling the ghetto with the fear of attack Trying to distract the fact that they engineering the crack So I'm strapped like Lee Malvo holding a sniper rifle These bullets to touch your kids And I don't mean like Michael Your body you sent to the morgue Stripped down and recycled I fire on house stickers that support you and like you Cause innocent people get murdered in the struggle daily And poor people never get shit and struggle daily This ain't no alien control Conspiracy theory, this shit is real. Written on a dollar underneath the Masonic seal. Y'all don't rap for dead presidents. I'd rather see the president dead. It's never been said, but I said precedent. Bin Laden didn't blow up the project. It was your nigga. Tell the truth, nigga. Push knock down the tower. Tell the truth, nigga. Push knock down the tower. Tell the truth, nigga. Bin Laden didn't blow up the project. It was your nigga. Tell the truth, nigga. Right, all right, all right. Peace and love, peace and love. This is your host, Bezel Bay. This is Trusty Training. We want to make sure definitely everybody's definitely getting it in, getting it in. Yo, all I'm saying, man, y'all definitely got to definitely get in where you fit in. I want to just make sure that everybody definitely understands that in Trusty Training, each and everything you're getting ready to hear is for educational purposes only. We do not profess to give legal advice. What we simply want you to do is understand this information for educational purposes only. In trustee training, I'm going to go over the CISO implementation, how it rocks, how it lines up, what you definitely need to do to definitely, you know, 
uh, be more involved. And again, for those that got questions, they want to get their questions answered. Let me drop this thing on you right here, right now. You can call into the number at three two three four one zero zero one zero three. Again, that number is three two three four one zero zero one zero three. That way, you can call in live. I can bring you on. Yo, we got about 4,228 listeners live. This is Trusty Training. You're live with your host, Bezel Bay. We're going to definitely get it in. Now, we're going to start from the top, start from the beginning. We got a lot of people that's actually trying to figure out, okay, what is this banking in the box concept? What exactly do I have to do to make uh, this this thing a part of my state? How can I use these things to actually um, preserve the integrity of my state? I'm going to tell you, all right, there's over 80 different types of trust. And because there's over 80 different types of trust, you're going to have to understand that there's a way that you can interdate and implement this information that's going to be given to you tonight. Now, I got a special guest. I got a special guest. I got a special guest. Real talk, hey, live in the building tonight, yo, it's going to be one of my um, mentors that actually, hey, real talk, without this dude, it would be no Bezel Bay. Real talk. Um, and, you know, he is a, an insurance expert. He's going to break down the do's and the don'ts, what you need to get started. Yo, but without further ado, let's let's paint the picture for him. Matter of fact, I'm going to hit you with one of my other uh, great, 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 great mentors. This is my brother, Sharif Ali. Um, he's going to actually break down some very intriguing information on how to utilize private banking with life insurance. Why is this important? Because, look, with a mining family capital trust – Banking in the box brings these, these things that we're going to be discussing to your door. We literally put the bank in a box and deliver it to your door. But you got to understand how to interdate and implement this information. So without further ado, Brother Sharif, I'm going to break this down. I'm going to come back, take some calls, take, answer some questions, You know, get everybody exactly what they need. This is the Urban Experience like never before. You're locked in live with your host, Bezel Bay. This is Trusty Training. Keep listening, because if you listen long enough, you just might learn something, man. Keep listening. Good day, good day. You are now tuned into the vault. Trust Christian, own nothing, control everything. Just wanted to do an episode today. Today's episode is going to be about private banking with life insurance. And so I wanted to do a post with a special individual that we do business with at the vault name is Christopher Holt. Uh, you know, many accolades comes with this individual's title. We do our best to do business with people that, you know, we, we can do long-term business with. So I'm very excited about being able to have Chris join us in this conversation and and bring and move forward. So just really excited about that. And uh, we're going to get him to join here. We're going to have a great conversation. Uh, private banking with life insurance. This is one of our experts. So Chris, you're live. Yes, sir. Yeah, all righty. Yes, this is about the work, you know. All righty, so <laughs> we're doing this as special on, on Facebook. We usually don't have the audience uh, uh, that we have from the Facebook to the YouTube with the vault, and so we're going to do that today. We're going to start out on Facebook, and then this is going to be downloaded and posted onto the YouTube channel, and then as well as the iTunes channel later on. So, uh, you know, Chris, Chris, Christopher Hulk, could you uh, introduce yourself and just, you know, let us know your background uh, I know a lot of people are interested in the topic, which is private banking with life insurance. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is again, it's Chris Holt. I've uh, been in the business now for uh, with the banking side of it, at least for about 10 years now. Uh, experience in financial services since 1992. So uh, I've been around, uh, at, came at this a few different ways to finally get to where we are right now. Okay, awesome. All right, I, we, Chris, why are we talking about private banking with life insurance? Could you tell us well, why that's important for common people to have, to have this type of discussion? Well, I think uh, for most people, uh, a lot of it is about taxes, uh, being able to save on taxes, uh, also being able to have a structure where they can have a system that can take care of a debt issue. Okay. Uh, what we realize and what we teach people in our organization is that, uh, what is it, those numbers, 40% hey, 
of all of your dollars that you make go out in form of taxes, taxation. That is going to be not just income tax, but that taxes that you pay on your cable, gas tax, state tax, uh, which is income tax, uh, sales tax, any other tax you can think of. <laughs> taxes are sales huge. Tax. Oh, sales yeah. tax. Sales tax. Yes, absolutely. All of that is a huge uh, piece of the puzzle that is being just taken automatically from you just by you simply just doing everyday life or making money. Uh, after you've done all of that, uh, paid your taxes, paid off your, uh, you know, done the things you go out to eat and do the things that you want to do, <laughs> excuse me, uh, you're really left with 23% of your total dollars that you have to be able to live on. So what we show people how to do and, uh, and with our system and what we have put together is to be able to increase the amount of money that they're able to save, pay less in taxes, get rid of the debt and the interest that is going out of your pocket that you're paying to other individuals. Uh, and with this system, uh, with, it not, with it being a system that is not taxable to you uh, and showing you how you can actually become your own banking system, it's something where every household should have it. <laughs> I don't care what your situation is. Facts. Every household should have it. And the thing about it is, Chris, is this is nothing new. This is something that's been going on since, you know, the 1500s and, and when banking was kind of, you know, around with the uh, the, the Rothschilds. You know, banking yeah. has been around. Families have practiced bank banking. And so yeah. – um, this is the form of private banking, and we're talking about it through specifically through life insurance and and why this is so important. And so, you know, that that's very important. But I guess people want to know is how are people implementing these pri- these private banking policies, Chris? Because they're like, okay, you know, we know that there's things that exist now. A lot of people don't even have this in their excuse me in their consciousness. So, right. what, what, how do how, how is it that these things were created? in order to even do this in the first place. Could you tell us that? Well, these types of programs have been around now for over 200 years. Uh, it's not something that's new. Uh, you've got companies like uh, J.C. Penney's, Walmart, Walt Disney was created through these types of policies. Uh, there are huge uh, conglomerates that were created simply by a banking policy that they knew how to structure hundreds of years ago. Um, and now they these kind of programs now have been uh, modernized to work with just about any family. It doesn't have to you don't have to be wealthy to do it these days. Uh, basically, it's something where if you have a representative that you work with that understands uh, the infinite banking concept, you have to be able to structure a life insurance product to where it will fit the system. Uh, because not all insurance products will allow you to do this type of a system. Um, when you think about putting this together with an agent, what will happen a lot of times is that they will not understand that they need to take a hit on the commission. <laughs> so they can't Uh-oh. structure the policy they would just for somebody. They have to structure it so that the, the individual can benefit more on the cash side of the policy. Um, so why do we use life insurance? Why couldn't this be done with a bank or, say, through any other type of investment? Well, life insurance is the only vehicle that allows you to be able to have a umbrella of taxation where the money you put into it and the money you grow within it, as long as you stay within the limitations of that policy, it is the only vehicle that will allow you to be able to have that all come out to you tax-free with no limitations as to how many of these policies you can have. There is no other vehicle that will do that. That's a fact, Chris. we got to say that's a fact. That is a fact. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, So if there was, I'm sure there would be other types of programs out there people would be talking about, but I'm telling you, there is no other system that allows you to be able to do what life insurance allows you to do when it's structured correctly. That is a huge thing. It has to be structured correctly. Okay, and that's how it's done. Is is it structured correctly? So that means you're like, how many agents do you think are out there like you, Chris, in the United States right now? Oh, jeez, I'd say uh, probably less than a thousand nationally. I would say that actually would do these types of policies uh, and understand them, the inner workings of them. It's less than a thousand over 
a million agents out there, but most of them are just simply selling you insurance. Chris is amazing. Chris said a thousand agents. Chris is one of a thousand out of three hundred million. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I'm in a good company. I like being in a rare company, man. You know, you're in a rare company, he, man. He, he, it just he, doesn't he, happen. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I, I would like to think of myself as in the top one thousand of what I do, but man, I mean, I, I, the numbers for what I do is is different. But geez, I mean, that's yeah. awesome. So it's how we structure, and that's what makes you so unique. So, right, how to. How 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 do we get involved with something like this if it is at the level where, you know, I got to go to a special guy. So now we know that you're the special guy, you're the legal guy, you know, right. what, how do we do it? Well, the first step is to get a snapshot of where you are. Uh, one thing that we do is we do a data sheet on everyone, and we'll give you a uh, a picture of your individual situation because everybody's situation is different. Uh, not everybody uh, is going to fit this system. It's just simple as that. You've got to have some discipline in place. You've got to have some discretionary income in place. There's different things that you've got to have in place in order for this to even work for you. So, uh, And you've got to qualify for it. It is life insurance. <laughs> so uh, we've got to do a data sheet on you to find out your individual situation and see how the numbers would work for you. That is the first step. Um, you can request, of course, a data sheet from me. You can email me at info at ffecorlando.com. That's info at uh, First Financial Education Centers, Orlando.com, ffecorlando.com. Uh, and just request the data sheet. I'll be happy to send that out to you. Uh, also, if there's a little presentation I send out to you, kind of explain to you how this works, give you a basic synopsis of uh, – creating your own family banking system and gives you a uh, example in that presentation of how it worked for a family that we call Mark and Joyce uh, in this presentation. So uh, we try to basically educate you on the system, whether or not it is for you or not. I hope my whole thing and my my company's goal is to educate you first and foremost um, so that you make an informed decision. Uh, This is not just about, putting you into something and you have no clue what this is, that, that's not what we're about. Uh, any and everyone that I talk to, they understand the inner workings of it because I'm constantly grilling them on, okay, well, what's, what's this situation? What should you do when this happens? What should you do when that happens? They can almost tell me how it works. <laughs> so by the time we're done with you uh, and before you spend a dime, you will know exactly how this can or cannot work for you. Info at F first F F first financial uh what is it, education centers? Yes. F F E C Orlando dot com. All right, I'm gonna type it into the chat for people that didn't hear it. Yes. Orlando dot com. Yes, sir. All right, cool. I typed it in the chat, everyone. It's in the chat. Info at F E Orlando.com. Yeah. And so, all right, Chris, uh, we do have a question for you. I want to, I'm going to get to it, but um, yeah, Chris. So the thing about it is, okay, you know, they, they, they have to, you know, pretty much know where they are. And I think that's a big issue in the marketplace to address out here nowadays. A lot of people don't know where they are, man. Right. And, you know, I really do want to do an episode about, you know, people not utilizing the debt. Uh, right. I think that means you can have a great conversation. There are a lot of people losing household capital income. Wealth for their children's education, for their own education is being lost yeah. because they don't use private banking. And right. I, and a lot of people don't understand it's not, you know, this isn't colloquial, conventional, get your, go down to some bank and get your insurance policy stuff. You yeah. know, and, and, I, and I really do encourage people to Think about that is when you have a, 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 a when you're paying for anything, you are practicing a form of banking. And point being is is the banking that we're talking about is specifically is private banking and specifically family household banking on right. a daily basis. And so, I think that a lot of people they think they try to separate banking like oh that's the bank and then this is me. No, right. yeah. <laughs> your family household is operating as a bank. There's money that comes into the household. There's right. money that leaves that household. 
Big and by, by money leaving a household, there's a form of money changing going on, in and out, cash flow, all of that good stuff. And uh, I just really want people to really understand that, uh, you know, there's a different way out there. Absolutely. And, and, and there is a way that's being practiced. And like you say, you know, knowing where you are can really enable you to say, okay, this is where I'm at so I can institute a banking policy. Right. This is just where you are. It's not because, you know, you're, you're, you're anybody special or anything like that. It's because you just implemented the policy. And that's right. the biggest thing is how many people are going to institute the policy. I guarantee you everybody on this line or most people are going to get cash flow. They're going to get cash flow for sure. They're, they're doing business. I mean, there are people listening to this that make thousands of dollars a month, mm -hmm. thousands of dollars a month, and that money is not being insured. Ladies and gentlemen, yep. if you don't have insurance on your company, that's the business Warren Buffett is in. He's in the insurance business. So – it's, I think it's very misleading when individuals don't understand why companies do corporate buybacks. Yeah. When you hear these things in the public, these are forms of insurance on themselves. That's and correct. so, uh, you know, I, I want you all to understand that from a, uh, this is, everything is finance. Everything's based. If you got money, you're in finance. What do I need to go to school to get a degree for it then? <laughs> you know what I mean? Everything's right. finance. We've been dealing with finance since you got your, your money from your parents for the birthday gift. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't save it, what do you do? You spend it or you lose it. I mean, it's not too many legal financial terms we need to know here. But yeah. for some yeah. reason, people go to school, get a four-year degree, and they still don't know what they're doing with their life. Yeah. And we're Maybe. talking about financial right. tools, financial mm -hmm. mindset, financial strategy, and people say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. So what if you can put yourself in a position where you're actually practicing – what well, all of these are practicing, which is private family banking, private banking. You see it across the board. You see the Rockefellers. You see the Carnegies. You see, like you even explained, Disney. You see individuals that started these companies. They understand internal private banking tactics. That's it. They understand the rules. They have pieces of – I remember when I first heard one of my mentors, he said, the difference between people that uh, are educated or uneducated, he said – is rich people know which tax forms to fill out and which ones not to. Right. It's yeah. that simple. That's pretty much it. <laughs> so if, if, if you all haven't been educated on the same documents that came out at the same time, whether it's trust uh, documents or whether we're talking about insurance, it, it, it makes no it, – it's, it's all imperative to get that information. That's it. And uh, we're speaking to a very niche and select audience. You know, everybody's not out for wealth building, wealth building, wealth generation. But you know, when someone can can tell you, hey, you know, it's less than a thousand people in a country of 300 million people, that you know, I provide a particular service that is very uh, valued. Um, like I say, it's 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 encouraging to see. Wow, there are still very specialized people in specific fields that that we're talking about policies now. Like, like every, everybody's heard about life insurance. It sounds good, you know. I might have to get health insurance. But, oh, my gosh, now you're telling me I can do it, and it's, and it's banking involved in it? Well, I never heard that before. I never knew about that before. So mm -hmm. I understand that that's the case, but, you know, like the mentors used to say, well, you don't know what you don't know. That's right. So, you know, there's many things that we don't know, ladies and gentlemen, and I think that, being open to learn those things are very, very important. So, you know, what? All right, all right. That's my mentor. Yo, I can, and I can get on that. That whole entire clip will be played um, later on tonight on our main broadcast, which is on 365 Live. Um, but you get the gist of it. The insurance mechanism is a huge component <clears throat> in what's being offered here with Banking in the Box. Um, and just kind of give you some highlights on that. All right. See, there's there's principles that go with this. So I'm so I'm so I'm gonna give you some stuff to kind of just wrap your brain around. All right. What you have is what we call we're gonna talk about arbitrage. That's a wealth building principle. I'm gonna show you where it comes into play. All right. Arbitrage occurs when a when a security is purchased in one market. Hint hint insurance and simultaneously sold in another market at a higher price, thus considered to be risk-free profit to the, for the trader. Arbitrage provides a mechanism to ensure 
insure, E-N, insure prices do not deviate substantially from fair market value or from fair value for long periods of time. With advancements, with advancements in technology has become extremely difficult to profit from price pricing errors. In other words, pricing errors in the market, many traders have computerized trading systems set to monitor fluctuations in similar financial instruments. Hint, hint, insurance. Um, any ineffective pricing setups are usually acted upon quickly, and the opportunity is often eliminated in a matter of seconds. Arbitrage is a necessary force in the financial marketplace. I'm going to show you another mechanism. Those of you that may have brokerage accounts, brokerage accounts that um, I'm going to use Fidelity Investments as an example. Let's say you have an actual um, capital, uh, what we call a cash management account, and you're actually um, purchasing or buying stock on what we call margin. Well, they use arbitrage in order for them, in order for them to move value very quickly from one put and again, I'm gonna use the, you know, I'm, I might be hitting with some technical terms. In the aspect of trading, when you use the term put, that means uh, put down. Um, that means when it's on a downward trend in a in a bear market. Um, when you're talking about call calls, meaning call up, when it's up in the uptrend, they use arbitrage in order to move in and out of these particular situations quickly, effectively, for maximum gain, minimal loss. Okay, this is a wealth builder principle, and at Amani Family Capital Trust, that's what's also that's also um, some of the thesis behind a lot of the things that we do, quote unquote, behind the scenes. Then the next one we talk about is debt securitization. Well, securitization is a financial practice of pooling various types of contractual debt, such as residential mortgages, commercial mortgages, auto loans, or credit card debt obligations, or other non-debt assets which generate receivables, and selling their related cash flows to third-party investors as securities, which may be described as bonds, pass-through securities, or collateralized debt obligations, or what you've heard is CDOs. Um, collateralized mortgage obligations are called CMOs. Investors are repaid from the principal and interest cash flows collected from the underlying debt and redistributed through the capital structure of the new financing. Security-backed by mortgage receivables are called mortgage-backed securities, or what we call MBSs, who are also backed by other types of receivables, which are called asset-based securities, which are called ABSs. Yeah, there's a lot of acronyms. There's a lot of acronyms. And those of you that don't know, those of you that are actually here for the first time, um, in every perspective space, whether it's accounting, whether it's investments, a lot of the terms are utilized in their perspective spaces in acronyms. But you know what? Debt securitization has been around for a long time. What makes this product so revolutionary is that we don't compete with debt securitization. We just bring into the, uh, the fold what we call asset securitization. Because, see, asset securitization is a way of raising funds by selling those receivables, which are then turned into asset-backed loans and securities. This method of financing brings various benefits such as diversification of funding sources and improvement in cash flow. See, the average individual, you know, we're all taught, go to school, get a good job. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm going to simply say this. I'm going to put on my accounting hat for a second. When you become an employee, 40% of your income is going to be taxed, one form or fashion. When you actually say, okay, well, being an employee is not really where I want to stay. I want to get my own business, so I'm going to specialize. <clears throat> you know, I'm going to become an accountant. You know, I'm going to use my trade as an accountant. So when you become an accountant, and specialize in that particular trade, watch this. You actually move from the 30 or 40% tax bracket to a 60% tax bracket. What do you mean? What do you mean, Bezel? You mean that when I – yes, because I'm giving you wealth-building principles. So when you are an employee of another corporation or entity, you're at a 40% rate. And when you move to become what we call a small – entrepreneur, such as one that specializes in accounting, you move from a 40% to a 60%.
Then, watch this. If you decide that, okay, well, being a small entrepreneur is okay, but I really want to get into big business, big business, you know, the entrepreneur position, you know what I'm saying? So when you move from the small entrepreneur to the big business, watch the difference. You just move to a 20%, a 20% tax bracket. Now, when you move to that 20% tax bracket, Here's where a Monty Family Capital Trust comes in. There are three types of tax positions, taxable, tax-deferred, and tax-free. Taxable is that entrepreneur, uh, is that small entrepreneur. Now, when you move to the tax-deferred, you move from the small entrepreneur to the big business. Why? Because the tax principles are actually written by individuals in the private that actually are in the tax-deferred component, but their ultimate goal is that when you move down to the investor, the investor actually can enjoy a tax-free environment. See how that works? Go to school, get a good job, puts you in a 40 to 60% tax bracket, bracket. Um, own nothing, control everything moves you to a 20% to a zero tax-free position. Hope this is making sense to you. Man, without further ado, let me see if I can get my mentor on here right quick, see if he's riding with us, see if he's here, so we can definitely get in where we fit in. Hey, Don, can you hear me? Last four digits of your number is 4277, 4277. Are you there? Uh, yes, sir. I'm here. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, man. I, man, how, how's how's been rocking out there, man? Uh, everything's doing well. Everything's doing well. You know, we just staying, staying, staying ahead of the game. That's all we can do. It's the knowledge that we're hey, that's all. implementing, not just uh, learning. There you go. There you go. That's that's the key, man. Well, well, from from what you're hearing thus far, and just from uh, uh an insurance professional, um. Give us your thoughts in terms of just how much of an impact life insurance has made in a lot of folks' family picture from from your professional opinion. Well, um, just from the past, um, man, just learning different concepts that's been around and not just learning them but uh, putting them into action. You know, it's one thing to Mm -hmm. to learn something, but uh, making it applicable to your life is, is is the best part of what, I'm seeing right now what I've been able to appreciate uh, with the clients that I've had in the past because um, mm-hmm. I'm teaching them things that they've never heard before. You know, it's like, you know, these rules of money have been around since the late 1800s. And, um, and when I'm dealing with people that, um, that have never heard of these different facts of uh, how to, you know, compound interest and how to uh, invest uh, looking for a higher rate of return and how to free up money to pay themselves first, uh, it's, it's really amazing, but then when you take the concepts that we're talking about today, like Mr. Holt was talking about, that just takes it to another avenue when you're talking about private versus public. I mean, I mean, my mind is just right. blown just from the uh, you know from the last couple of months and that we've been talking. And so right. you know, it's, right. it's, it's very important. It's very important. Very important. Very key. Um, in the aspect of wealth building principles. Um, now, I know you guys, man, just, just sitting at your tutelage, uh, watching the entire industry go from, okay, there's an insurance side of this financial picture. And we always mm-hmm. knew that the banking was a, was a main part of it. But to be a part of where banking and insurance came together under one hub, and then from that point to what we have today, seeing how it's grown um, – from just from your opinion and, and actually being an expert in this industry, um, would you say it makes sense that you have to somehow, some way incorporate that type of um, philosophy into your um, your estate planning? Oh, definitely. I mean, because uh, without uh, having any type of uh, adequate amount of coverage, I mean, it's really hard, hard for you to even st- uh, talk about having an estate uh, planning or, or setting up a trust without having your insurance in place. 
Um, for so many right. years, it's uh, we've been conditioned to think certain things when it comes to insurance. You know, from generations, we've been conditioned to think that we only need enough life insurance to bury us. And that's just going right. into the fact of what you're talking about as far as um, uh, when you're talking about that, that just being in the public, I mean, in the private sector, uh, going mm-hmm. to school, get a good education. Well, life insurance was the same way. You just need enough to bury you. We've been conditioned to think that from the uh, uh, public sector so they can make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. I mean, who wants to be in a contract, for one, until you're 100 years old, you know, and Correct. who wants to be in a situation right. where, uh, you know, the, your cash value goes back to the company and not back to the family when there's an option that stays such, you know. But the true exactly. definition is to be able to replace the income of the loved one that is lost. And when you can do That's that, right. uh, not only do you get an opportunity to pay yourself first, but then you can look for a higher rate of return, and then you can put yourself in the type of knowledge. Matter of fact, the knowledge that we had before meeting you guys, mm-hmm. before you guys had this platform, it only uh, – crippled us to be in we, we couldn't think outside the box we had right. to be in the box right. because that's the way we were conditioned to think you know but right. uh, with knowledge you know everything is possible you know so that's i appreciate right. what you guys are doing because it gives us an opportunity uh to leave uh, a legacy of wealth from generation to generation that's instead right. of passing on debt which we've been doing for you know for for centuries correct Correct, correct. See, the debt securitization model, and this is what I always tell a lot of um, potential trustees and those that I run into in the, in the marketplace. Um, debt securitization, I want you to think about it as like a permanent industry that they have perfected an entire system around. And there are wealth-building principles when you gain a certain level of information, knowledge, if you will, um, that can allow you to control that marketplace. Once you control that marketplace, then you're looking at an insurance policy like, wait a minute, okay, it's not just a death benefit. It's actually an asset that I can use to grow Mm -hmm. the family estate. Like I'll give you an example. Like I tell folks this all the time. Um, and there's another concept that um, those of you that actually received the actual um, invite to this particular um, trustee class, um, what you're hearing is the concept of what we call infinite banking. But I'm, I'm going to throw something else on top of that. It's called velocity banking. And this right here what really made sense to me. Velocity banking allows you to take this structure, and let's say for argument's sake. Um, you're looking at a parcel of real estate. Or let's say you're already in a mortgage. This is a perfect example. Let's say you're already in a mortgage. Well, velocity banking, just like with the insurance policy, just like you heard my uh, my mentor, um, Brother Sharif and um, <clears throat> and, uh, and and Mr. Chris Holt, um, when you're able to utilize the insurance policy as your own private bank, you can actually, if you're going to invest in the commercial real estate, you can utilize the leverage that's in that policy to actually acquire that commercial real estate. Now, watch where velocity bank com- banking comes in. Okay, with velocity banking, you just heard me give you the whole breakdown on asset-backed securities, mortgage-backed securities, and arbitrage. Well, there's a, there's a special contract that we put together with Amani Family Capital Trust, which will allow you to utilize the life insurance component – if you are already in a mortgage product, guess what? There is a security that's backed, that's backing your mortgage. We're able to also draw capital, just like the insurance policy, from the already existing mortgage-backed security. And we'll provide that as passive income. So not only do you have an ability, because I want you to think about this. I'm going to show you the power of what we're talking about. Not only do you have the ability to use an insurance policy to, like, like again, example, if you Actually, and I'm going to use the word borrow, if you borrowed the money from your insurance policy to buy the home and you're in a structure where you're making those payments, you're not paying a money family capital trust back. You're paying your estate back, and everything that you pay back, you're able to go back into with another what? Contract. Now, when you have velocity banking, what you did not know in the fine print that they most – lenders require you to have your payment in on what? Between the 1st and the 15th of each month, right? They usually require you to have that payment in between the 1st and the 15th because those securities kick out caps and dividends on the 16th of every month. 
And they're usually three to five times your premium. So we utilize a system called home ownership through share ownership. Home ownership through share ownership, where you can utilize the infinity banking system, velocity banking, where as long as you're committed to it preserving the integrity of your estate, these things that were once mystified, codified, and out of reach are now general intangible assets that you can actually utilize to perfect, expand, and build your estate because wealth is passed on to the second and third generation. It's our job to build the wealth. Now, at this stage of the game, everybody that's actually in this trustee training, your job as a trustee is to grow those assets and to um to build these things up in order for you to have assets to pass along to the beneficiaries. So the velocity banking and infinity banking concept makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. It's scary. And not scary in a bad way, but scary in a good way. So, man, um, definitely. And, and again, um, those of you that are definitely locked in, this is my guy. This is my insurance guy. <laughs> um, Don, uh, me and him go way back. And um, like I said, without him, you probably wouldn't have heard of me. Um and with that being said, um, Don, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go around the room and see if anybody has some questions about, you know, the insurance mechanism, what they need to do, how does it work, what does it look like, so they can kind of get, a, you know, a real good concept of, a, of how this stuff works. Um, you, you all right to take some questions? Uh, sure. Yeah, that, that's what you need. Okay. 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 <laughs> all right. Let me see what's up and see what's happening. So just hold on for a second. Let's see. I'm going to go down the line see what's up and see what's happening. All right, now I'm going to be calling you out by your last four digits of your number. And again, those of you that are listening in the listening audience, if you got a question over anything you're hearing at this particular time, please dial in at 323-410-0103. Again, that number is 323-410-0103. Um, I'm going to go down the line just see if anybody got any questions. If they don't have any questions, then I'm going to definitely turn up the heat and bring some information because I'm going to show you how all these concepts work into the new CECL implementation because the new accounting standards actually paves the way for you to do all these things that we're talking about. So let me um let me just take a couple of calls right quick and just see, you know, who may have some questions, you know, going on down the line. So let's let's see who we got here. All right, caller, last four digits of your number is going to be seven nine eight three. Seven nine eight three. Seven nine eight three. If you can hear me loud and clear, let me know if you're there, man. Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> Islam, Islam, what's good with you, man? Islam, can you hear me? Oh, man, well, you coming in loud and clear, coming in loud and clear, man. Coming in loud and clear. Hey, touch your face with you. Yeah, you're coming, you're coming in loud and clear. I'm checking in to see if you got any questions, comments, or concerns of anything you heard thus far. Um, yeah. Um, I'm checking okay. in um, from uh, Atlanta. I wanted to ask a right. question about, um, I thought I heard the gentleman say that was not a question. I just wanted to make sure while I was taking notes. The gentleman said that in um in in this in, in this particular uh in this particular format of of using the uh, insurance policy, you could have multiple policies. Was that correct? Don, you want to chime in, or you want me to fill in? Uh, yes, you can have multiple policies. Uh, that it, yeah, that is correct. And, and so my question is, but depending on the situation, but yeah, it is possible to have multiple policies. Okay. Okay. Even with Did one company, you can have. Say again. Go ahead. Different types. Let's say, let's say I have a a a a, a homeowner's a, a business policy, uh, a, 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 you know, personal health policy, uh, permanent, you know, life insurance permanent policy. Insurance. Okay. Correct. I, 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 correct. Correct. And, and just to um, just to add, see the the, the different types of policies. You got to remember. Okay, in the framework of accounting, if it's an asset, it can be used if you utilize certain accounting concepts and principles. Well, I'm gonna give you a concept. This concept will allow you to do exactly what you're talking about. This concept is actually called the equity concept. 
And um, let me give you a minute. I'm going to break this down to you how this works. The equity concept of accounting will let you use any type of insurance policy in this mechanism. So let me let me bring this up so I can definitely put you on point on how this actually works. Give me a second because I want to give it to you directly from the horse's mouth. So that way we're all on the same sheet of music here. So hold on. I got the document right here. Let's see here. All right. Here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, let me give you the equity concept. Let me give it to you from this side of the fence. All right, matter of fact, I'm going to do it like this because I can probably do it a whole lot better if I, if I break it down to you like this. Okay, the equity concept literally says that, okay, it's an equity concept, but in GAAP it's called entity concept. We utilize it as equity concept because – if it's an asset that you can demonstrate that you hold a position of equity, if you are the beneficiary of insurance policy or you're the owner of the insurance policy, your accounting equation is going to look like this. You're going to have assets equal liabilities plus equity. Okay, let's now go to the liability side. When you actually have these policies, you're you're actually making monthly contributions, correct? So those are your premiums. So that demonstrates that you have a what? A liability. All right. So you just passed the first prong test. Second prong test. Okay. When I when I literally are making these liability payments, um, I have a value. I have a value in my homeowner's policy. I have a value in my car um, insurance. I have a equity position in all insurance products because as the owner of those policies, these are liabilities on my ledger. So I am allowed under the equity concept, which is actually the entity concept, to be able to utilize those assets, which we're going to entitle general intangible assets, to be able to utilize this in my infinite banking platform and structure. Hope that made sense to you. Yes. Yes. Good deal. Good deal. Good deal. Good deal. Uh, any other questions? Not for me. Okay. No more questions. Okay. We'll go down. I'm going to check again. We're going to check in. We're going to keep it moving. We're going to keep it moving. Let's see. Let's see. I'm going to go down the line. I'm going to check in and see. Let's see. Let's see, see what we got here. Okay. Uh, caller, last four digits of your number is going to be 5116, 5116, checking in to see if you got any questions, comments, on, or concerns of anything you heard thus far, anything you've heard thus far. It's Islam, Islam, peace and love. Uh, peace and love. John, good to meet you. Good to meet you. Uh, Brother Bay, I've been following uh, your, your your program, and this concept is, is very interesting and, and intriguing to me. Um, I'm wanting to implement um, and I wanted to initiate, wanted to initiate and implement uh, just exactly the type of format you guys are talking about today. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, my question would be at its lowest level, at its lowest entry level, um, how broad of a format could I could I develop? Okay, all right. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna help I'm gonna help you out, and I'm gonna let my, my my man Don definitely do what he do. Okay. Now I'm gonna use me and Don as an example, and I'm gonna use what you're asking. Okay, how broad this could be? Well, what Don? Yes. What is? All right. So Don, I'm gonna ask the question. In the aspect of participants in insurance programs that you um, that you're uh, in charge of and, and have a level of implementation, what is typically the requirements for an insurance policy? Um, you, just, you need a you need a, a million dollar policy. Like okay, a million dollar policy. So so what are usually the requirements that go that start with a million dollar policy? Um, well, let me uh, ask for medical questions and get some coverage. Uh, I mean, it's really that simple. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate you. Yeah. I appreciate you, Don. 
I appreciate you. Maybe, right. Maybe I should right. so, like. So, yeah, maybe I, I should try to narrow this down a little bit. Okay. Now. Okay. This concept, this concept right now is very new to me. It's very new to me. Mm-hmm. It's the first time hearing it, and I'm 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 basically in the process of setting all of this up. Uh, homeowners, mm-hmm. I'm not. Uh, mm-hmm. I just established. I'm, I'm I'm in the process of establishing all of this right now. Um, well, let me ask you: this. What state are you in? Right now, right now I'm in Chicago. I'm in Illinois. Oh, Illinois. Okay. All right. Great. Oh. Yep. Mhm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in. I'm in the process of uh, of setting all of this up. I'm. I'm trying to structure it. I'm trying to see actually um, how I could utilize this format to structure, you know, uh, mm-hmm. a wealth building process for my family and myself. Um, if 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 with a brand okay one question and I'm gonna get off and I'm gonna let somebody else talk. One question with mm-hmm. a brand new policy, and with a, a, a brand new application, how quickly can um, I implement any 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 service out of, out any, of this any, okay. out of this program? I, I can I can definitely answer that. So all right, this is how it works. Okay, when when uh, when the agent writes the policy. Typically, within the first 30 days of the policy being in force, we're able to, through the infinite banking and velocity banking component, um, assess the value of the policy. Um, there's going to be additional riders that's going to be attached to existing policy. So once the policy is written, step one, then the next, next part of this is actually attaching a rider to that policy, which is usually done within the first 30 days of the policy being enforced. And then once that rider is attached, the banking component recognizes that insurance policy vehicle as a banking product, making the insured, the trustee, over that structure. So what they're literally looking at from the banking side of it, the um, the information is actually looking at, okay, the insurance product isn't just for death benefits. It is an actual general intangible asset that's to be used by the trustee who has a fiduciary duty to the beneficiaries that he or she is administering over. Okay, so once that is put into play, then we simply allow a line of credit, which will allow you to spin down the value without interrupting, dissecting, or desecrating the actual benefit that's there. Because we created a line of credit from the asset that the trustee controls. You heard the concept, control everything, own nothing. Now, when you're dealing with a trust, even though the trustee implemented the policy when the rider is attached we're able to treat that policy as being owned by the trust itself and a trust can do things that none of us on this line can do the trust is actually a legal entity it's it's an artificial person it can own property it can sell property it can lease property it can do everything that you can do in the space upon which it administers over. That's why in the aspect of the wealthy, they always, always, whether they publicly declare it or not, always operate from an aspect of trusteeship. They're in a trust. Um, you, you guys who know me, you know this is, this is my spiel right here. When you literally understand that when you are engaged into a trust agreement, and for those of you who don't know whether you're in a trust agreement or not, if there is an application, if that application is then taken to some sort of system and it is registered, which means it's a registration, and there's also a certification. In this case, the certification is the actual receipt that my, my guy Don will leave with you once the policy is written. Once the policy has been put in place, you're going to receive other certification from the company that's actually backing the policy. That certification, those three things merit that you are actually in a trust agreement. So the banking structure treats the entire arrangement as a trust agreement, and they're simply providing under the rules and provisions of the trust indemniture the mechanism in order for you to grow the estate. It's all about position. It's all about position. Hope that makes sense to you. 
Come to yes, the lot. Yes, Come it to does. Yes, it does. All right. Uh, one, one other, right. one other question for Don. What, what would like have a member of uh, of this of this agreement in in dishonor? What, what? I mean, when you look at a guy and you look at what he what he's formatted and you look at what he's trying to do, what, what? I mean. What what would help? I mean, you have like I know you have a structure that's like uh, for uh, assistance with accounting. You have uh, mm-hmm. a structure for like you know entry level bronze and stuff like that. Um, okay. Okay. When a person, I, uh, how can how can mm, excuse how, me? How but can, thank how you. Can, I, I, thank I, you. I'm gonna let you I, know. I see what you're saying. Right. Like um, now, from the banking side, this is this is what we're gonna consider favorable terms and conditions. Unfavorable terms conditions. Now, um, Thank now remember, you. Don. Okay, okay. Don comes from the insurance space, so just like he said, as long as you can answer the health questions, and we're dealing with a million dollar policies, nine times ten they're going to take some sort of blood. So as long as there isn't any um, contributing factor, you know, with your health, you know, like you just was diagnosed with cancer, now you want to run out and get a million dollar policy, that could be an issue. As long as you're able to meet the requirements for the insurance product, and as long as that insurance product is being utilized in, or we'll talk about the bronze level. All right, the bronze level with Imani will will literally look at that policy and say, okay, look, who's the trustee? Okay, all right, so we'll say you're the trustee. All right, now we look at the trustee. What type of assets does this trustee bring to the table? Okay, uh, the insurance policy. As long as you have those preliminary things that will allow the infrastructure to take place. This system is designed to take a person in a, in a bronze level all the way up to a platinum level. In other words, you can start at bronze and go directly into a platinum position. Um, we we prefer that with all of our clients, they really get the, uh, the mechanism in infinity banking because it provides, I'll say it this way, outside of trust, there's going to be limitations. I'm going to tell you why. Um, you may have you may have four or five or six different policies prior to you talking to both myself and my partner, Don. Okay, without a trust, now I'm limited to what I can look at because you're in a 14th Amendment space. Uh, remember, you're falling into that employee Maybe going into a small business owner capacity. What's the tax bracket in that? You got forty percent to sixty percent. You know, so there's another issue there. Um, when you come in from a trustee perspective, we're all looking at you in the what? The zero percentile. If you're dealing exactly. with a trust, you're dealing with wealth building principles it's just like coming into the investor world you're an accredited investor that means you know something you're comp- you, you know you're competent so when you bring these things in and you're not afraid to use these things to further perpetuate your estate that's the demonstration that gets you through the door if you're showing up with all of the other things and not the fundamentals then it becomes a question of okay you know and again what you get with the bronze level is the education. Just like I told another gentleman yesterday, we're not just going to turn you loose with this capital without instructions and education. We just covered the fact okay. that public education teaches you to go into the 40% and maybe the 60% tax bracket. Why do you think the private sector who took over the public school system makes that part of the regiment. Why? Because the public and private don't mix. The private sector knows that in the trustee position, you got to be what? Competent, liable. You got to be liable. A trustee isn't just someone that's just Superman and doesn't have to do anything. He or she is the most liable component in this. But when you're in commerce, you're expected to be an an expert. So when you're considered an expert, you're going to come with at least the fundamental concepts, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, the fiduciary uh, fiduciary duty. So uh, I, I apologize, Don. I thought that you were yeah. with the Money Trust, but you are actually an insurance. Correct. Right. Uh, he, he's, he's right, right. He's he's my guy that I use to bring those components to play. Because some of my clients, you know, it's no secret. A lot of our a lot of our people don't have 
the insurance. You know, the first thing as an accountant, I asked them is, okay, what kind of assets are we talking about? And you know, they start talking about the project they want to do and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, okay, okay, when are we going to get to the part where if something happens to you tonight, <laughs> how are you going to transfer really? wealth? You know, and it's like, you know, because see, that's that's where you come. That's where where, where where Don comes in at because I saw a lot of trustees that looked like you and me with great ideas and great concepts, but they didn't have the fundamentals to get in the door. Now, when you got the fundamentals to get into the door, then it becomes easy for us to do this on 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 this 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 particular level. So I'm so 25 that degrees. Way, I'm okay. 25 okay. degrees to the to the west instead of 25 degrees okay. to the east. Degrees. So, there if you if go. I can interrupt there you, you if I if I sure. can if I can interrupt you, there, brother Bay. Um, sure. Don, some of your entry level policies. You you spoke about a million dollar policy. Um, you spoke. Well, I, I like to hear what it is that or how much would a person how much how much would uh, a 250 thousand or 500 thousand or million dollar policy cost. Well, and what it would look like really if depends you're able. On the individual. Uh-huh. Depends on the individual okay. and okay, average yeah, average. The age. My my myself, I'm a truck driver. I make like what maybe like forty two thousand dollars a year. What would you suggest? He said, "What's the?" He said, "What's your age?" Um, today's my birthday, July twenty third, oh, nineteen fifty eight. Oh man! All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> You said 1958. Yeah, 58. 58. 58. 58. Okay, okay. Okay, um, okay he's going he's gonna to work up a quote for you. Yeah, and then if you're a smoker or non smoker, that makes a difference. Um, yes, I am a, but, a um, Easy. I mean, it's easy about a. It could be about a $80 for a, what, 50 maybe? Um, right. If you could uh, transfer Don in it. Yeah. Say, no, say it again, Don. If you could transfer if you can transfer any information, you know, to, to get signed up. I don't know if you have a a contact right. here in Illinois. Uh yeah, you can well, uh, that, just email you know, me. Um uh, take my email down and I'll get you squid. It's uh go, go he has a Don. I'm sorry. Go ahead, I'm give, ready. give me give me your email. Okay, it's D as in Don, E as in Elizabeth, L as in Larry, E as in Elizabeth, N as in Nancy, Z as in Zebra, O as in Orange, and then the number seven. So that's DLenzo7 at gmail.com. That is DLenzo7 at gmail.com. Okay, as D as in Don, E as in Edward, yeah. yeah, I have it, I have it. Okay. I have it. Good I deal. That way, in the, that'll work. That'll work, man. That'll work. Well, we go, we got some more folks to definitely in, so we're gonna go down the line and see if we got any other questions pertaining to infinite banking, velocity banking. So we can definitely get it in. So hold on for a second. Hold on for a second. Let's see who else we got. All right, call. Now, I will tell you one thing too. Um, All right, um, call a lat. Lat. Yes. Oh, go, go ahead, Don. Go no, ahead. I was just gonna say. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> It, 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 it's a wonder <laughs> to understand too that most times the uh, a, term, a, a policy that we're talking about is uh, is is less per month as far as premium as a traditional policy is. So Correct. just wanted to put that out there too. Exactly, exactly. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right, all right. Call the last four digits of your number is going to be four zero one one. Four zero one one. If you can hear the sound of my voice, I'm checking in to see if you got any questions, comments, or concerns of anything you heard thus far in trustee training. Four zero one one. Can you hear me? No, I can hear you. No question. I'm just taking everything all in, taking some notes. Taking some notes. Okay, good deal. Good deal. No questions. Okay, I think he's just taking notes. Okay, good deal, good deal. We'll go down the line, see if we got anyone else that may have some questions. Let's check in. Let's see who we got here. Caller, last four digits of your number is going to be 3380. 3380. We'll check in and see if you got any questions, comments, or concerns, or anything you heard thus far. Uh, can you hear me? 33. Well, we can hear you loud and clear. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. 
No, I don't have any questions. I'm just listening. This okay, is, uh, good deal. Clayton. Good deal. Oh, Brother Clayton, all right, we got him checking in. We got him checking in. That'll work. Well, with with that being said, we literally want to make sure that everybody understands that the insurance mechanism is very important. Now what we're going to go over is how to see so play into the fold. Um, now, for those of you who don't understand what CECL is, CECL literally is uh, what we call current expected credit losses, current expected credit losses. All right, now, current expected credit losses, you can put in parentheses, are actually current, we'll we'll go here, an allowance for credit losses. So if you can identify your current expected credit losses, you're able to use those losses as an allowance. Now, I'm going to give you an example. The banking structure, finance, and commerce are governed under what we call UCC, which is Uniform Commercial Code. Okay? Uniform Commercial Code. And in Uniform Commercial Code, you have this clause that's under what we call Article 9. All right? Now, I'm going to give you just, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Article 9, I'm going to give you just a little bit of information on Article 9. All right? And this is entitled, What Article 9 Covers May Surprise You. As most lawyers know, Article 9 of the Uniform Commercial Code covers secured transactions and personal property. Indeed, Section 9-101 is the very first section of Article 9, and it says simply, this article may be cited as Uniform Commercial code dash Secure transactions. What could be simpler? Let's yet comment on section 4, subsection A, 29-101. Adopted at the time of this amendment to Article 9 that became effective in 2001. See, they list about nine separate ways in which the scope of Article 9 was expanded, meaning it was expanded, it was covered, it was thrown over other things in those amendments without changing the title. See, some of those changes are not germane to this discussion, you know, but it is definitely in our discussion when we're talking about oil and gas taxes, things of that sort, which are unrelated to health care insurance receivables, non-possessory statutory agricultural liens, consignments, or commercial tort claims. But some of the expanded coverage is general to our topic. See, most germane to our discussion is the sales of payment intangibles. Write that down. Put that right beside Cecil. The term that's called sales of payment intangibles, the sale of payment um, intangibles. In other words, I'm giving you an actual gap, and IRIS, for those of you who don't know what IRIS is, let me give me, because I'm hitting you with a lot of acronyms, so let me, let me, I don't want to go too fast, too far. Let me give you what iris actually means, so your own your own point, because I want you to really understand how these things tie in. Give me a second, give me a second, because I know some of you guys are taking notes, so you want to make sure your notes are what proper. Give me a second here. Because see, GAP governs one side of the accounting principles, and iris governs a different one. Um, you also have what they call FASB. Um <clears throat> IRIS is the International Financing Reporting Standards. I R, I mean I F R S. That is the International Financial Reporting Standards. So you have GAAP, which stands for General Accepted Accounting Principles, and you have IRIS, which is International Financing Financial Reporting Standards. All right, under under that, you're able to utilize. This chart of accounts, which is called sales of payment intangibles. All right, let's 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 back up, however, literally, and look at the definition of security security interest in Article One, the general provisions under the UCC. See this section of nine two zero one and A thirty five, which is inconveniently we can call it AS forty five zero one twenty one thirty eight, and it defines security interest as this. 
Security interest means an, an interest in personal property or fixtures that secure payment or performance of an obligation. Security interest includes an interest of a co-signer or a borrower of accounts, shadow paper, a payment intangible, or a promissory note in a transaction that is subject to AS 45.29. Security interest does not include special property interest as a buyer of goods on identification of those goods to a contract for sale under AS 4502-41. But a buyer may also acquire a security interest by complying. Y'all caught that? If you comply with Article 9, if you, if you, if you comply with it, Except as otherwise provided as 45-02-505, the right of a seller or lease or of goods under AS-4502 or AS-4512 to retain or acquire possession of goods is not a security interest. But a seller or a leaser may also acquire a security interest by complying. Keyword comply. When you show up with that policy, you're complying with an Article 9 security interest, which allows you as a trustee to utilize that asset in the infinite banking, velocity banking concept. Now, CISO allows you to use what? An allowance of those credit losses. An allowance because you're going to classify that, you know, remember, we're moving you through the accounting space simultaneously, giving you tangibles you can implement and preserve your your, your state. But you got to know what these things are so you know what you're actually dealing with. Because a lot of us want to know, well, how do we do it? How do we do it? How do we do it? It's very simple <clears throat> when you're understanding the principles of accounting. GAAP regulates commerce in the public space. FASB, F A. SB is the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which is a private organization, private organization that looks at commercial transactions that are governed under the Securities and Exchange Commission. Why is the Securities and Exchange Commission concerned about what you're doing in the aspect of commerce? Everybody's heard of cash, right? C A S H. Cash is actually a Federal Reserve note. If you have one in your purse or your wallet, pull it out. Examine it. When you examine that Federal Reserve note, you will realize that it actually has a serial number. It's endorsed. It's a promissory note. It is a security. It's a security. So when you're participating in commercial transactions, Exchanging securities without a license, you are in direct violation of the Security and Exchange Commission. But if you understand what you're doing and you articulate it, you document it, you substantiate it, you bring in your accounting ledger to say, no, this is what I'm doing. As a trustee, I can possess those Federal Reserve notes and I can transact those Federal Reserve notes because I have an Article 9 security interest in that transaction because I'm using those things to endow the estate upon which my group administers over. Now, I don't want you to say it exactly how I said it because that might be a little too much. Now, I know somebody saying, well, Bezel, you're going too fast. Slow down. What did you say? No. I understand the fundamentals. It's all accounting. See, in the competent space, you're not afraid to show another competent trustee what it is that you're doing because you have to be very clear and what also transparent. You know 98% of the transactions are done first and accounting second. This is why they got to insure you because they know when you come and you want to borrow something from me, you know, I'm not going to get all of the dirty laundry. You're going to put your best what? Authorized representative in front of me. You know, you may have, and I'm, I'm going to use the word, uh, you might have jazzed up the books. You know, you might have cooked the books. You might have done some things. So when I see you, I'm expecting you to put your best foot forward. But guess what? In that transaction, I have the most risk. So, to lessen the risk, I'm going to show you how competent I am. I'm going to let you know that I understand the banker's rule. 
because as long as I can demonstrate that I have an Article 9 security interest in anything that I do, I am allowed the immunities and protections under the Uniform Commercial Code. I hope this makes sense to you. I hope this is making sense to you. I hope this is making a lot of sense to everybody that's here. Um, what I'm going to give you right now, what I'm going to give you right now is a couple of things. First thing I'm going to drop on you, you just heard from my other mentor, um, and, and shout out to my man Don for definitely you know riding with us this, se- this segment here. Um, I'm going to give you a concept that I want you to wrap your brain around. And this is actually going to talk about, let's see, which one do I want to hit you with first? I want to hit you with, okay, let's talk about the monetary system. you got to understand the monetary system. And again, CECL, financial institutions have to comply with the new CECL regulations. That's why you see a lot of things that are posted up on our Bitrix link, giving you blow-by-blow, play-by-play of the playing field that's being leveled. And if you really take advantage of these things that we're talking about right now, you can actually get directly in the path of this wealth transformation. Um, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you – his name is Professor Salami. He's going to talk about the monetary banking history. You're going to learn some things. If you've never listened to Professor Salami – um, he's, he's he's a really good teacher, and he gives you a lot of information. Matter of fact, those of you that are actually in Bitrix, send me a direct link, and I can give you the whole series of all of his teachings from banking to actually implementation to the Federal Reserve. Very good um, information that you can actually use to help preserve and protect and, and uh, perfect your, your estate. Um, after, after this segment, I'm going to come back. I'm going to break Cecil down. We're going to go over the accounting principles. I'm going to take some more questions, and we're going to make sure everybody's definitely on point. Keep listening, because if you listen long enough, you just might learn something. Lecture 4, Monetary History of the United States. In the last lecture, we talked about the views of Steve Forbes and Ron Paul that the United States would be better off if it returned to the practice of backing currency with gold. Some of what motivates supporters of a return to the gold standard is concern about the power wielded by the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States and those who run it. The proper role of the federal government in monetary and banking affairs was debated early and often in the history of the United States. The federal government tried twice in the 19th century and failed both times to create a central bank that would oversee other banks and maintain a national currency. The question of whether or not a national bank would concentrate too much power in the hands of too few occupied the founding fathers as they wrote the Constitution and considered legislation in the first sessions of Congress. The connection of this concern about the abuse of power to the use of gold as money is straightforward. If gold coins are money, then anyone who has gold has money. While mints converted bullion to coins, citizens typically had the right and sometimes the obligation to trade their bullion to the mint for gold coins. If, on the other hand, a national bank was able to issue paper money, then those who controlled the bank could increase or decrease the quantity of money in circulation without reference to the availability of gold or any other scarce commodity. That ability is power. And it is power that some of our forefathers feared. But others of our forefathers believed that creation of a national bank and paper money were essential to the development of our nation. Today, we shall see that disagreements about financial arrangements in the United States were tantamount to disagreements between competing visions for our new nation. Imagine, 
It is December of 1790, and you are visiting the third session of the first Congress of the United States. The ink is barely dry on the Constitution, which was adopted on September 17, 1787, but not finally ratified by Rhode Island, the last day to do so, until May 29, 1790. What will you see? What you will witness as you visit Congress on this particular day is a debate on a proposal offered by Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury, to charter a national bank, the Bank of the United States, which we now refer to, as we'll see, as the first bank of the United States. The Senate passed Hamilton's bill authorizing the bank on January 20, 1791. The House, after much heated debate, approved the bank by a vote of 39 to 20, with most of the yes votes coming from New England, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. President Washington at first seemed to be convinced that the bill was contrary to the Constitution. He had gone so far as to instruct James Madison to prepare a veto. However, Hamilton counter-argued that the purpose of the Constitution was to set up a workable government for the United States. Hamilton argued that government had the power and the right to employ, quote, all means requisite and fairly applicable to the attainment of the ends of such power, provided that they were not precluded by the Constitution itself and not, quote, contrary to the essential ends of political society, end quote. What Hamilton meant was that the United States, in order to fulfill its potential as a great commercial nation, required financial and monetary systems that would facilitate payments and trade. Well, Washington was convinced by Hamilton's argument and signed the act incorporating the bank on February 25, 1791. The bank was located in Philadelphia. After temporary location at the Carpenter's Hall on Chestnut Street, the bank moved in 1797 around the corner to its permanent and present location on 3rd Street between Chestnut and Walnut in a building designed by Samuel Blodgett. When you go to Philadelphia, take a look. It's still there. The forces arrayed in, full, in favor of and in, in opposition to the Bank of the United States mirrored, as I've said, competing visions for the evolution of our nation. So what were some arguments in opposition to the bank? Well, some opposed the bank on the grounds that the Constitution did not explicitly permit the federal government to create a bank or issue paper money. The Constitution authorized the federal government to coin and forbade the states from doing so. The Constitution forbade the states from issuing paper money, but was silent uh, as to what the federal government might do. The Constitution forbade the states to make anything but gold and silver legal tender, but omitted to say what the federal government might do. The Constitution likewise forbade the states from impairing contracts. Now, this latter prohibition is monetary in nature because the depreciation of legal tender paper money was thought to violate contracts. Some opposed the creation of a bank explicitly because they were opposed to the issuance of paper money. They feared that paper money would invariably lead to schemes where debtors increase their wealth at the expense of creditors. Indeed, the United States had ample experience with cur currency depreciation. The Continental Congress issued paper money, they were, it was called Continentals, to finance the Revolutionary War. And by the end of the war, Continentals were essentially worthless. 
Some opposed creation of the bank because they were opposed to the federal government setting up perpetual institutions, which they considered to be a hallmark of British government and a threat to personal liberty. An agrarian representative from Georgia, James Jackson, demanded, quote, Was it not the ecclesiastical corporations and perpetual monopolies of England and Scotland that drove our forefathers to this country? Some opposed the creation of the bank because they thought that it was a threat to the agrarian way of life that they believed was the best way forward for the United States. Thomas Jefferson, in particular, argued for a self-sufficient way of life that eschewed trade, especially trade for European manufactured goods. With all that opposition, could there be offsetting support? Yes, yes. Some, and notably Hamilton, favored creation of the bank because they favored the development of a commercial United States. Indeed, one of the reasons that the Articles of Confederation proved unworkable was that individual states interfered with cross-state trade. In the Constitution, those committed to commercial activities sought arrangements that promoted trade and commercial growth. Some favored creation of the bank explicitly because they favored the creation of paper money. Why? For many rural Americans, economic activity amounted to raising crops and bartering surplus crops with neighbors. While these individuals were industrious, they rarely exchanged their labor or its fruits for gold and silver. These farmers were frightened that if taxes were specified to be paid in gold, that they might lose their lands because they didn't have access to gold. One of the complaints of Daniel Shays and those who participated in Shays' rebellion was that creditors demanded payment in gold and silver when there was not enough specie in Massachusetts to pay the claims. Some favored creation of the bank because they agreed with Hamilton's interpretation of the Constitution cited earlier. While Congress and President Washington allowed creation of the bank in 1791, a later con Congress allowed its charter to lapse 20 years later in 1811. In 1791, when the Bank of the United States was established, there was no banking system in the United States. There were four isolated systems centered in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. But after the establishment of the Bank of the United States, the various systems coalesced into a single system that exchanged one another's obligations and maintained ongoing debtor-creditor relationships. The Bank of the United States functioned a lot like a central bank because of the Bank of the United States was the main government depository, it ended up as an important creditor to state and local banks. It lent those state and local banks money. And because it was their creditor, the Bank of the United States had the power to regulate local banks by pressing them for payments. Do what I want or I'll make you pay sooner. Some important individuals did not like the discipline imposed by the Bank of the United States. Famously, John Jacob Astor of New York was furious because the bank had denied him credit. The third and fourth presidents of the United States, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, had opposed the creation of the bank in the first place and had not changed their minds by the times their presidencies began. And some continued to dislike the fact that some of the shareholders in the Bank of the United States happened to be British. There was a bill to extend the charter of the Bank of the United States, and it was tabled by the House in a vote of 65 to 64, and defeated in the Senate by a vote of 18 to 17, with Vice President George Clinton casting the deciding vote. Clearly, the country remained divided, and closely divided at that, on the role of the federal government in banking and financial matters. 
important constituencies continued to disagree about whether the bank was an important and appropriate source of financial discipline or whether, on the other hand, it amounted to an infringement by the federal government on states' rights and individual rights. The forces that favored a bank tried again and succeeded five years later to establish a second bank of the United States in 1860. But this arrangement did not go well. Unlike the first bank that had been ably run by Albert Gallatin, the second bank had operational difficulties almost from its beginning. Essentially, and very importantly, the second bank behaved perversely. Here's an example. A panic and a recession swept the United States in 1818. But the bank, rather than extending credit to offset these recessionary forces, was forced by its own lack of reserves to call in credit and intensify the recession, the exact opposite of what we would expect a central bank to do today. The death of the Second Bank of the United States came at the hands of none other than President Andrew Jackson, who believed that it was corrupt and wanted it to cease operations even before its charter expired in 1836. Some political analysts likened Jackson's effort to those of a gallant knight doing battle with some monster. Jackson instructed the Secretary of the Treasury to deposit federal tax receipts in state banks. Think about that. Deposit the own receipts of the federal government, not in the federal bank, but in state banks. So, not surprisingly, the second bank began to run at a loss and was converted to a regular bank when its charter was not renewed and went bankrupt several years later. So for a time, the federal government was not a, a front and center in national financial matters. But it's said that necessity is often the mother of invention. And as we shall see, the necessity in this case for government revenues brought the United States back into the business of banking. The time is the Civil War between the states. And the need for revenue on the part of the federal government finally settled the debate about federal involvement in financial matters. The federal government did not in particular resume control over the monetary system in the United States until the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 1864. At the beginning of Abraham Lincoln's presidency, Treasury Secretary Salmon Chase had on hand approximately $2 million, a tiny, tiny fraction of what Congress had appropriated to begin war preparations and an even smaller fraction of what he thought was necessary to prosecute the war. In 1861, the U.S. government suspended payment in gold. We've seen this before in our lectures. In 1862, it issued new legal tender paper currency that were called greenbacks. Backside was green. The National Banking Act of 1863 and 1864 created a system of federally chartered banks called national banks that were sur supervised by the newly created Office of the Controller of the Currency. That office still exists. National banks were required to purchase treasury bonds as a condition of their establishment. So national banks were required to lend money to the federal government. What did they get in return? They were then allowed to issue greenbacks for up to 90% of their bond holdings. So we have a new national currency and banks can issue it if they lend to the federal government. These two banking acts also created a tax of 10% on banknotes issued by state chartered banks. And the intent, quite plainly, was to drive state chartered banks out of existence. 
Many of these state chartered banks did convert to national banks, but some survived by accepting deposits rather than by issuing notes. According to Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz in their Monetary History of the United States, 2 Hundred and ninety-two million dollars worth of national banknotes were in circulation in 1867. The creation of the first U.S. dollar can be fairly said to be a byproduct of the federal government's desire for a source of revenue to finance military action during the Civil War. In the last quarter of the 19th century, two important questions faced the United States. When would it return to the gold standard? And would it permit the coining of silver? 100 years after Congress debated the question of whether to create the Bank of the United States, Congress continued to be divided on the appropriate role of the federal government in financial matters. Once again, the issue of what would be money was hotly contested. And once again, like in Andrew Jackson's time, a prominent politician became known for his stand on monetary issues. During the greenback period, there was a dual monetary standard with both greenbacks and gold circulating as forms of payment. But there was no fixed trading ratio or exchange rate of one for the other because the U.S. government did not offer to exchange gold for greenbacks at some fixed price of gold. So, not surprisingly, the price of gold in terms of greenbacks rose dramatically during the years of the Civil War. Currency became less value, valuable in terms of gold. Gold became more valuable in terms of the currency. Once the war ended, the greenback price of gold did decline gradually, and by 1872, it was only about 10% higher than it had been in 1861. So with those two prices coming close together, it raised the question, when would the U.S. return to the gold standard? As the U.S. paid off its war debt and the greenback price of gold came closer to its pre-war level, debate was touched off about when the U.S. would return to the gold standard. And there was debate about whether the United States should allow the coining of silver as well as gold. Let's reflect on this a little bit because this is important. From the Coinage Act of 1792, either silver or gold were legally money in the United States. Okay, So from 1792, one could have gold coins or silver coins circulating in the United States. Until 1834, however, only silver circulated as money. Why? What's wrong with gold? Well, it's a simple answer. Gold was too expensive. And people had an incentive to melt down gold coins in order to use the metal itself. Silver coins they left in the form of coins. In 1834, there was some new legislation. And it replaced the 15 to 1 ratio of silver to gold, which had been set down in the 1792 Act, with a new ratio, 16 to 1. What does that mean? Well, in 1792 a unit of value in silver had to have 15 times as much metal as as a unit of value in terms of gold. So a dollar silver coin would have 15 times the weight of a dollar gold coin. In 1834, that was changed to a 16 to 1 ratio. That legislation ended silver's dominance as money and made gold the metal of choice for coinage. Now, family, I'm going to definitely hit you to some things that you need to know, especially for those of you that actually have private holdings. If, if I were to tell you that 
in your private holdings as a trustee, what would be your ratio today in the marketplace? Um, those of you that actually have access to the Internet can actually type into your Google search uh, debt clock. Type in debt clock in your Google search. And when you type in the United States debt clock dot org, you're going to get it in real time. And I'm bringing this up to show you an example for those of you that have private holdings or what you're really holding in comparison to what you think you're holding. This is important because you need to understand how these things operate. So let me go here. Dollar to gold, dollar to silver. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Now, those of you that have paper, remember the ratios of the 1700s. And I'm going to wrap you around a concept, an accounting concept that's going to allow you to do so. Write these numbers down. The paper to silver ratio now is $197.50. To one. Again, the paper to silver ratio is one hundred and ninety seven dollars and fifty two cents. The paper to gold ratio, the paper to gold ratio now is one oh eight, one hundred and eight dollars to I mean, $108.30 to one. So you have a 197.52 ratio to one for silver, and you have a 108.30 to gold. Write this down, because what I'm about to explain to you, you'll be able to actually determine the value of your private holding. First, I must explain to you the accounting concept, which is called the entity concept. <clears throat> the entity concept starts like this. It is very important to note that for accounting purposes, the business is treated as a unit or entity apart from its owners, creditors, and others. In other words, the proprietor of an enterprise is always considered – is always considered to be separate and distinct from the business which he controls. All the transactions of the business are recorded in books of business. That's your accounting ledger. Though they belong to the proprietor. From the point of view of the business as an entity, and even the proprietor is treated as a creditor. Creditor. Okay, as a creditor, what's your ratio for silver? 197. What's your ratio for gold? 108. Okay, as a creditor to extend to the extent of his capital. See, capital is thus a liability. Capital is thus a liability. Capital is thus a liability. I'm saying it three times. Like any other liability, although the amount is owing only to the proprietor because the proprietor controls the silver, controls the gold, he sets the rules. There's a standard that's in place. For every bit of paper that he holds, he's able to constitute contracts that are valued at $197 for one troy ounce of silver that he holds. In the, co in, in the case of sole trading and partnership concerns, the proprietor may even draw the amounts out. Did y'all hear that? In the case of sole trading and partnerships, what you've been studying with Jonathan May, you have the ability in sole trading and partnership concerns, the proprietor may even draw the amounts out. So you can draw out into the public through your contracts that $107 ratio 
for every piece of silver that you hold in private holdings. You get the ratio of $108 for gold. Okay? All right, we'll go a little further. <clears throat> but in the case of corporate bodies, shareholders stand on a different footing. See, they cannot reclaim the amount they have invested. They can sell the shares to others if they desire to unload their investment. Therefore, in the case of corporate bodies, capital is paid out only at the time of winding up. And winding up is a term in business. Put that in parentheses, study it a little bit later, winding up. Um, it actually, um, we go a little further, provided surplus assets, there's your surplus assets, are available after paying off the creditors. So let me get this right, Bezel Bay. If I use the entity concept, I can literally use my private holdings that I hold in real money, which is gold and silver, to offset public obligations? Of course you can. This is called the entity concept. It's always been in accounting. But again, as a competent trustee, you have to know this. You have to know this. You have to know this. Okay. <clears throat> Therefore, in the case of corporate bodies, capital is paid out only at the time of winding up. Provided, provided surplus assets are available after paying off the creditors. In the case of companies, the entity concept is more apparent as in the eyes of, of law. It has separate legal entity independent of the persons who contributed who, who contribute its capital. Remember, when you hold those private holdings, you're in a whole different separate class, a separate legal entity. I told you a trust can do things that you and I can't do. It can hold assets. It can sell assets. It can apothecate. It can monetize, it can monetize those things. In other words, banks trade promissory notes and bills of exchange just like you do with Federal Reserve notes when you pass it to local merchants. They do this all the time. The concept of accounting entity, the, the, the concept of accounting entity for every business determines the scope of what is to be recorded or what is to be excluded from the business books. See, the company will record those things that are required by GAP and FASPI and the International Financing Standard Board for those purposes to amend and to appease those that are in the public spaces. But private holdings, that's why you see corporations that are privately held, privately owned. Entities that are privately held in trust, privately owned by trust, understand this entity concept, which we use under our Monty Family Capital Trust as the equity concept. It's been known throughout the planet. It's only new to you. Um, in the case of corporate bodies, since there are too many contributors, the amount is shown under a single account, which is called, and write this down, you want to know what you call this when you issue your paper? You call it share capital account. When the, corporate, when, when the trust has private holdings of gold and silver, and they want to induce that 197 to 1 ratio, they must use a shared capital account to do so. Okay. In the case of non-corporate bodies, there is no separate legal entity. Still, the principle of business ent entity is exerted for accounting purposes. For example, although for legal and most practical purposes, we regard the sole trader and his business as one and the same thing. We nevertheless, for accounting purposes, regard them as a different entity. Therefore, in business, only the business assets and liabilities are recorded, although legally there is no distinction between his business assets and liability and his what? Private assets and liabilities. Thus, the concept of legal and business entities are not compatible with each other. This is why our mentors teach what the public and private do not mix. You want to get in trouble? You want to have a visit from them alphabet boys? Co-mingle. No one goes to prison for dealing with general and tangible assets. Those that are in prison 
somehow, some way violated some sort of statutory code, and they was messing around with those Federal Reserve notes because the two don't mix. I want you to think about it. This debt clock is telling you if you got private holders, you got 197 to 1 ratio. Why the hell are you still fucking around, fucking around? Ignorance of it is no excuse. When you're trading, when you're when you're exchanging Federal Reserve notes, you're actually committing five federal offenses. It's a felony. Trustees, get this in your head. It is a felony to go out without a safety net and not substantiate your transactions. They don't immediately haul you off to prison. They just tax you to oblivion. Remember, the education system has taught you to go to school, get a good job, so you can be in the 40% class, and then if you get more schooling, you're going to move to the 60% side of the fence. But if you master these accounting principles, you get to move to the tax deferred, which is the 20%, and then ultimately to the investor side, which is 0% tax liability. Let me give an example. Barack Obama, we love him to death. Barack Obama was on the employee side and small entrepreneur. So it was 40% and 6%. His policies rolled into effect in accounting a 40% and 60% tax rule. I told you guys 20 months ago. The legislation that Barack has put in place, he talked about change, but was it the change you thought it was? He put provisions in place that put you in a component where if you do not substantiate your transactions, you're considered a tax fugitive. You are a tax fugitive if you don't substantiate. You are a tax fugitive if you do not utilize Cecil. Now with Donald Trump, you're dealing with an investor that is on a 0% tax liability. What do you think he's writing into legislation? Remember when Hillary put him on the spot, she said, well, you know, it's true that um, we have, we're actually able to get some of your tax um, holdings, and, and you haven't paid taxes since, you know, this, that, and the other. And, you know, and she said, what do you think about that? What was his response? That makes me smart. That makes me smart. See, Hillary and Barack Obama were in the 40 and 60% level. Donald Trump is in the 0% level. You're not in Kansas anymore. You can say what you want about Donald Trump, but he's one hell of a trustee. And ignorance of it is no excuse. See, likewise, in the case of consolidated statements, accounting entries is much larger is much larger than the legal entity. You, if you master this entity concept, the CISO implementation will allow you to grow these assets expeditiously, expediently. I'm going to use the example that I used in last night's class. See, this happens every day in your transactions. You're just not recording them. This is what I want you to do from here on out. Every commercial transaction that you engage in, even if you're using what you call a debit card and Federal Reserve notes, you take that receipt and you take your pen, you take a picture of it on your smartphone, and you entitle that entry as a statement of account. Why? Because debtors call them receipts. Creditors know their statements of accounts because this is accounting, and I'm, uh, and I'm accountable. See, under the statements of accounts, you can convert that transaction into a CISO implementation process. Because if all of us practice transparency, we get more bang for the buck. Because the system has moved into this new component. Now, if you want proof, because don't take Bezel Bay's word for it, just simply go to the debt clock. If you bring up the debt clock, 
Look down in the very, if you're staring at the United States Debt Clock org, when you're staring at the clock, I want you to look at the clock and move all the way to the right where you're going to see corporate tax revenues. And then you want you to go all the way down to the right where you will see in the last two sections, paper to silver ratio and paper to gold ratio. They said the best the best way to hide something from us is what? Put it in right. I'm going to open up the line to see if we got any questions because I'm going to really go hard in the paint with Cecil. And I want to make sure I haven't lost anyone. I want to make sure everybody really gets what we're talking about. I want to make sure that there's no, you know, because see, the infinite banking concept and velocity banking concept and Cecil implementation are the order of the day. And when you're selling money, you don't have to be a hell of a salesman to sell it. Hey, Mr. Johnson, I ain't lost you yet, have I? Hey, Don, you still there? Uh, yes, sir, I'm still here. Okay. I didn't lose you, did I? No, no, I'm still here. I, I, you caught my interest there <laughs> one more time. You just got me breathing and standing funny. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm trying to make sure everybody's awake, brother. I'm trying to make sure yeah, everybody is up. awake. Okay, yeah, I had to make sure that up. everybody is. I want to make sure everybody's awake because the way this thing goes, they spelled it out when they actually started posting with the internet, the dead clock. And I always tell mm-hmm. trustees, if you really just pay attention to what they're saying, you got to notice there are industries, you know, I'm going to give you some industries that are actually buying silver and gold right up under your nose. Uh, matter of fact, if you're communicating to me through what we call a cell phone, tons of silver and gold in that little device that you call a smart device. Mm-hmm. They actually recycle it. Uh, any program that's actually invested into communications, you know, they're putting satellites and various different things up, huge contributor because gold and silver is a conductor of energy and in, in electricity. Matter of fact, if you got a desktop computer, the Pentium processor, you know, a oh, little birdie told me this. I won't get nobody in trouble. Little birdie told me there's a certain process you can do with an old CPU where you can actually get almost a half an ounce to an ounce of gold out of it, out the, out the processor. An ounce of gold goes for fifteen hundred. Amazing. <laughs> so, um, see these industries because gold and silver has an intrusive value. It's being used as an industrial metal. See the new quantum computers, man. Imagine the type of gold and silver those guys use. So. They have to keep – remember, they educated you publicly that you're going to what? Buy these things because you need to what? Communicate. Not realizing, again, if you are simply a trustee looking to – you know, you don't want to get into the stock market and get into speculatory investing and all that stuff. But you want to try the true method that has nothing to do with the stock market, just follow the money. Do accounting. Smart money follows smarter money. So – what I'm looking at is, all right, I see a 197% ratio to paper. Okay, well, who's buying gold and silver? Okay, Microsoft, Dell, HP. Okay, I just named out five or six computer companies. Okay, they're buying it. Okay. Are they going to stop buying it tomorrow? Nope. Hmm. So that means my silver that I have in my private trust holdings has a value. Of course it does. Hmm. So if I wanted to offset a debt, for my brother, if I'm my brother's keeper, and I'm holding silver, couldn't I just do that with a promissory note? Of course you could. The thing is, you just have to understand the um, the level of infrastructure. You have to understand the infrastructure. And as you understand the infrastructure, you're able to definitely you know, rock with this. Now, we got another minute left. Um, those of you that had not called in, if you don't call in within the next uh, minute and 12 seconds, you're going to be locked out. So we, we want you to definitely ride with us because I'm going to definitely, you know, pull my hair down, so to speak, what little I got left, and um, let you definitely go in. Let you go in. Um, and this particular concept, 
Again, the number is 323-410-0103. Again, that number is 323-1, I mean, 410-0103. Well, man, tell me what most most intrigue you about what I just covered. Don, you still there? I, I, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm flabbergasted, man. I mean, I mean, you, 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 you just evolved to another level that I, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm just proud of just to hear you speak and to just educate us about the possibilities that can be, you know, processed so and activated just, just, that, just based right. on knowledge. I mean, just for the examples that you were just using, as far as these, 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 even with the, the people that you mentioned, the forty percent. Right. The zero percent, I mean, just put yeah. knowledge into action, man. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. Right. Just having the right, right. Um, right documents and knowing what right. you're doing having and ta- right. knowing what you're talking about. Correct, correct. Because so, I mean, we all have a part, to, right? We all have a part to play in this, and and you gotta understand, we we're in an information age, and I and I look at the information age as one of the many paths to freedom. See. We, we, right. We've all seen these old television shows like Bonanza, Gunsmoke. You got to remember, you know, and I and I and I and I look at those days as an indication. Okay, now, at once upon a time, we wasn't as dumbed down as we are today. Even though we didn't have computers and smartphones, we at least understood the fundamental principles of wealth. It started with land. Let's let's back up. Most of the old westerns mm. that you actually look at, you got to think about it. You know, think mm. about this. When the sheriff rolled up on these people property, you see the old man come out on the on the porch with his long drawers and a shotgun. He says, "Hold it right there, mm. sheriff. You can't, don't come no further." Now I want you to think about mm. that. You mean to tell me a man of the land had that kind of authority? If you was attached to the land, that was elodial. Hmm. It was elodial. You understood that the land possessed the minerals of the earth. Everything that we are dealing with is fruits from what Mother Nature has given us. It doesn't belong to us. We're just stewards over it. We're supposed to leave it in what a better condition than where we found it. True. Now watch this. And everything. Or Bonanza and Gunsmoke and all the other old westerns. You always have the sneaky banker, you know, the guy with the curled up mustache and the top hat. You know, he was always plotting on trying to get Farmer Brown's farm. You know, he was all. You got to understand the philosophy. Hmm. He had you trade your elodial piece, your your elodial property for a piece of paper, and you've been enslaved to that paper ever since. And we live in an information age where if you hold precious metals, you can endow your paper. I want you to think about it. The Federal Reserve note is backed by debt. If you're holding gold and silver, what's your paper backed by? Gold and silver. I'm, uh, and, and again, I'm going to give everybody a chance to definitely weigh in. This is why insurance, you come in the door with the insurance, we can really expound on Cecil Inf- infinite banking and velocity banking because we can really have a real fun conversation if your mind is open. If your mind is open. Because, you know, a lot of people say, well, if it's that easy, why everybody ain't doing it? Because everybody has a faith and belief in going to school and get a good job. While the private sector, they're still, they're still buying Lear jets and yachts and still going on vacation. You might not can't go on vacation like you used to five, six years ago. They're going on more vacations. You know, before, you know, they don't even let their children enter day in the public school system unless it's for social activities. Because you got to give them the fundamental wealth building principles. I mean, we'll go back to Donald J. Trump. When his granddaughter was off the chain, you know, he put her on Front Street. He loved her to death, but he's like, I'm not going to let you destroy what we built. It ain't about your first name. It's about our last name. Think about that for a second. He said, now you can use this trust, and if you need a place to stay and you need to feed yourself, you got that. 
But everything else, I cannot let you play on that playing field because you're going against the grain. This is family law over here. I remember in the 90s, in the early millennia, what Donald Trump said, and I quote, not only will I run for president, I will win. I'll be the first president that's going to make some money. Why don't you think about that for a second? Well, we'll keep going. Let me see who else has got any other questions on there, because I know we should have some questions. I'm, I'm, I'm going to check the channel right quick. Let's see who we got. All right, caller, last four digits of your number is 3380-3380. I'm checking in to see if you got any questions, comments, or concerns of anything you've heard thus far. No, I'm just listening, man. Just... No questions? Everything starting no. to make a little more sense? <clears throat> yeah, everything makes a, a lot more sense. Lot more sense. Good deal, good deal, good deal. All right, let's go down the line. Let's check the channel. Let's see who else we got checking in, getting it in. Call the last four digits of your number is 5116, 5116. I want to see if you're still riding with me. See if we got any other questions, man. Islam, Islam, peace and love. Um, peace and love. Tax fugitives. Mm-hmm. Could you Could you go over that one for me again? Okay. Tax fugitives. Okay. Under the Barack administration, I want you to go back to the very first his very first term. One of the major things that he will go down in history as, especially in the, the Chronicles of Accounting, is that when there was a major influx in the banking industry, he bailed out the banks. Remember he wrote that huge stimulus package for the banks? You know, because they was getting ready yeah. to go under. They was actually – getting ready to crash because bezel three said if you can't pass the stress test we're moving you off the playing field we're actually taking those assets we're forcing these banks into insolvency so to detroit. preserve the economic system right there we go i'm glad you brought up detroit the stimulus money that he infused and brought the banks back to life did that money stay here in the united states That's good. Did it question. stay in the I, I would say, I would say, I would say, yeah. Well, then again, uh, from your, from from the uh, the lessons, no, because they shipped off all the uh, all the workers, <laughs> all the they 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 found uh, they, well, they, it went to China. Okay, right. That. So you got to understand, right? So so if you was a trustee and you was running this corporation. And you're like, okay, well, hell, I can put all of my brothers and sisters to work, but they want twenty, thirty, and forty dollars an hour. I can go over there to China and pay them eight dollars an hour. I had to make an executive decision. Right. Now, when I explain it that way, it doesn't sound all that bad. What I'm saying is, there was an accounting principle that was at what at hand. But keep in mind, they took your gold and silver away, and they gave you an exemption under HR one ninety two. The debt clock, look, they don't talk about HR 192, but they're like, damn it, you got the debt clock. Now, if you can't read and do math, I don't know what else to tell you. We don't get paid to educate you around here. You know, it is, you know, when Donald Trump said making America great again, you better pay attention to that. <laughs> he's not talking about it like you think. He's like, look, this is, when, when he literally, when he literally, when he literally brought it that uh, you have to really pay attention to what's going on demographically, this is what he was pointing out to. Um, so that's that's what I mean by the um, the tax fugitive component. You know, you're now considered a tax fugitive if you just if you're just filling out 1040s and 1041s and you ain't never done any accounting, you're on borrowed time, bro. And Cecil, look, if they're going after the corporations first, where do you think you are in that gap? On the wrong side of the fence. Right. right. It's about substantiation, brother. It's about substantiation. So that's what I mean. He, he put it in different policies that literally Cecil is going after the corporations and entities. Barack already done told you because they know how we rock. You know, we claim independence that ain't ours. You know, the system ain't stupid. 
they are like, okay, well, keep using these social security numbers. You're going to find out we, we, we got a plan for all of that. So that's what I mean by tax futures. You consider it a tax future. That's all why right. they talk to you the way all they talk. You. That's why they treat you the way they treat you. Look, you chose a benefit. Look, the Constitution doesn't give you rights. It protects rights you already have, and rights can only be given by the Creator. <laughs> if you think a piece of paper gonna give you some rights, you're in the wrong side. You're on the wrong side of the equation again. Now you're emotionally correct, commercially wrong. All right, all right. So that's what I mean by that. That's what I mean. Any other questions? Um, mm. I've got some stuff written down. I got, but you know, I want to be fair to everybody else. Uh, what about what, 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 what surplus assets? Surplus okay, assets. Surplus. And what offsets? Surplus entity concepts. Right. Right, okay. The entity concept and surplus concept is this. Because you, in your lifetime, you cannot remember when you could actually exchange gold and silver in trade and bartering. But you were, but you were brought up under the exemption clause on the HR 192. So the surplus of assets is when you, you know, I want to take control of my straw man. You know, we hear all this, that, and the other. Okay, when you show up as a trustee, you got a surplus of assets that you got to what? Substantiate. The birth certificate is a different conversation. You know, I ain't going to get into that right now. I'm going to just simply give you the accounting principles. The birth certificate represents a value that was placed into an, an implied trust. It's an implied trust because it came from the implementation of legislation. You have to express what they did in the implied trust so you can demonstrate your Article 9 security interest in a trust that you are a beneficiary of. So when you express the trust, now you move from the beneficiary side to the trustee side, and you got to utilize accounting to substantiate. When you do that, you have a surplus of assets. And you can use those assets to offset public obligations. And that's that's the uh, UCC one. Um, does that does that place those entities on notice? Is that what that does, or not? Hello. 